Listeners, this is an interview from Dink Denver 2019. This is the uh, Peenies. Uh, if you are unfamiliar, they are the writer and authors for the Elf Quest series that has been going for the last 40 plus years now. Uh, the reason we are doing this post introduction, where it's obviously I'm not at the convention anymore, but I'm I'm here on camera, is because we did have a slight technical error with our camera situation. So for a chunk in the middle, uh, I had to get creative with the video editing. So that being said. This is our, I, I, I didn't want to just cut out the footage because I felt like the interview was too important and the audio is fantastic. So this is our interview with the Peenies. Once again, nerds, we are here at Dink Denver, and we actually got the privilege of doing an interview with the Peenies. The Peenies, you might know their previous work, ElfQuest, or their previous, their large body of work with ElfQuest, uh, 40 years, had, and, counting. And, and still going. Uh, how would you compare when you started 40 years ago to when you put out a book today? There is no comparison. <laughs> in 1978, the independent comics Didn't exist. field was brand new. Right. Retailer shops were brand new. We had an open playing field. And ElfQuest went into that great vacuum and exploded into it. Now, Lord, I mean, just look around. Yeah, very much. Um, there's so much creativity here, so many, many people doing their own thing, making their own comics and their own contribution to independent comics. Um, frankly, if we had to start ElfQuest today, I would be terrified. Because <laughs> the field is a very different place. And now, now what you started was a cup of water in a desert because it didn't exist very much. I mean, that's not to say you were the first, but you were definitely one of the first large profile in indies. Well, now everyone's an indie, so yeah, I can I totally see that. And you, I'm sorry. Well, there are some ways in which ElfQuest was a first because it was the first fantasy comic to be written and drawn by a woman. It was considered to be, is considered to be America's first manga and anime influenced oh, I did not know comic. That. It, uh, you could say that ElfQuest is the first American manga. That's interesting. Yes, nice. yes. Nice. It, was and all it also was the very first graphic novel series done in America to make it into the big chain bookstores. I did know that one. That one I did know. Uh, so because it is, it would be considered the first American manga, have you guys gone to uh, Japan and, and uh, do you have like a, a strong following out there for traditional manga readers? We were, we were invited to Japan in 1994 because the Japanese publisher industry wanted representatives from American comics. They brought out Will, uh, uh, Will Eisner. Yeah. It's sort of the grand statesman. Right. They brought out some artists and writers from DC Comics representing the mainstream, and they brought us out representing independent comics. That's they fantastic. also wanted a woman, uh, because so many women work in the uh, manga industry in Japan. Yeah. It's normal there, yeah. but back in the mid-90s, it was still kind of rare, so they wanted a female voice That's added really to awesome. the group. And they, I think they wanted to pick our brains a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, People have asked, well, have you been translated into J Japanese since you are manga <laughs> influence? And we found out a very interesting thing. The Japanese don't want to translate an American manga comic into Japanese, but they were willing to have Wendy create a new comic for them. Specifically. Specifically for them to publish and then license back to nice. the U.S. In other words, to compete with ourselves on the shelves. <laughs> So I, we don't know to this day how large the fan base is in Japan. We do know that at anime conventions, a lot of people know oh, yeah. of ElfQuest and are fans of it. 
all we do know is that ElfQuest is known around the world and has been translated into a dozen or so languages. That's, so. that's really awesome. Um, sorry, I'm kind of taken aback by the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> so is this your first underground comics convention? Probably not. No, so this is your first Dink, Dink specifically. Dink. Yeah. So have you guys done cake in the past? The Chicago... Chicago Expo for, or I can't remember, Chicago, Ani comic book anime, Chicago something. Are, are it's in Chicago. C2E2? No, 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 C2E2 is, is sh a different one. Cake is, is like Dink just in Chicago. Ah. No, no, we, we've never we've not. Cake. So what is, what is probably a more well-known underground convention you've done besides Dink? That, that is a tough one to answer. Uh, you know, I think, to be honest with you, we have not done something that is this aggressively indie yeah. in many, many years. Yeah. I can recall years ago going to APE. Okay. Um, and there's another one whose name or acronym I can't remember. <laughs> All these oh, acronyms. Oh, SPX, the Small Press Expo. Okay, okay. Uh, but we haven't been to one of those in a long, long time. This is revisiting something we haven't seen in a long time. Does Well, you see, ElfQuest started out as a fully independent comic, but it also has the distinction of having been published by the top three mainstream publishers. Currently we're with Dark Horse, but Marvel and DC has also published and reprinted new uh, and new material wow. from ElfQuest. So we occupy a very strange <laughs> spot because, you know, are, are we truly an independent comic? Well, yes, we own the rights and we have never let them go. And, and you didn't let Marvel and DC or Dark Horse tell you this needs to be in your book. No. no, nobody messed with it. On the other hand, we have certainly collaborated with and and had a fine relationship with these great big mainstream companies. What I have said, it's almost a catchphrase right now, independence does not equal isolation. And sometimes people in the independent community have looked at us as almost as traitors because <laughs> you know we're getting into bed with the enemy if we're, right. if we're licensed right. yeah I'm sure you've heard that a lot yes. yeah, we, we, yeah. Uh, but my my jealous there you go <laughs> jealous much uh, my feeling has always been it is number one reason is to get the story out there yeah and if someone who is bigger than we are, who has resources that we don't have, is willing to partner with us in a non-intrusive, non-destructive relationship, we will use the hell out of them just Absolutely. as they're using the hell out of us. Absolutely. Why not? It's yeah. mutual ben mutually beneficial. That yes. makes total sense. And it's advice we would give anybody in the independent comics today. If you can find a partner uh, that is more established, that wants to work with you, but retain your rights... Why not? So there was there was actually some really interesting comic book news that just happened. I believe it was Avanti Press. I might be I might be misremembering the the name of the company, but they're they're opening it up so they will it's comic books made to order. So you make a comic book. Say you were to start today, like you said, you would be so afraid to do. <laughs> Say you started your own comic book today and you've never done it before, you have no connections in the industry, you send them your, your mains, they will turn it into a book for you and you have to buy your books. It's like 80 cents a book. Okay. So that right there lowers the level the bar for entry for anyone to get it because you can it's it's on newsprint so it's not like the high quality semi-gloss stuff that you're seeing in stores but that's how a lot of these indie comics work so like does that give you hope even more hope i guess i should say well, for the indie community there is a an old saying old saying <laughs> in the independent comics <laughs> industry which is anybody can get their first issue out the trick is, can you get your second issue out, and your third, right. and so um, on? Can you maintain? Can you maintain on time, on schedule? Um, that's the trick, is endurance. Yes. Because when a lot of these kids find out how hard it is, how expensive it is, how it will consume every minute of your life if you let it. Now, many are called, but few are chosen. Also, and this is purely pragmatic, when we started, it was a very simple system. You somehow got your comic book produced, right. which written, drawn, printed, 
and that's then, I think the big step that most people don't know where to start. That's why the Avanti thing is such big news. Yeah. But well, I, I apologize. And, Continue. And that's fine, and and that that is where they can go. But for us, forty years ago, a big, huge part of it was distribution. Yeah. How. How are all of these kids, how were we going to get our right. comics seen by enough people to buy enough copies so that we didn't go broke? Right. And back then there was a distribution system that consisted of a dozen independent distributors. Now there's exactly one, and that's Diamond. Diamond, yeah. And they have their criteria for getting in, uh, you know, into the catalog. Um, but if you're not with Diamond, how do you get seen how do you that's not a question that I am prepared to answer I don't pretend to know all the avenues via the web yeah. via well, via print is, catalogs and all of that my theory is the internet plays a huge part in a lot of kids getting their properties seen and uh, talked about and responded to and feedback uh, the internet I would say is a vital component of you as an independent Absolutely. publisher now. Absolutely. And that actually goes for all comic, or not just comic creators, but content creators in general. That is absolutely the 100% the truth. That, that is the only way to get seen anymore. And even then, it's drop it, a drop in the ocean. It's, it is a very crowded field. Yeah. And just as we had to do 40 years ago by having a, you know, a product that people loved, that grew in circulation with every issue, you have to rise above all of the voices on the internet if you want to become well known, if you want to become a success. I don't know how people define success anymore. <laughs> That, they actually, last year at this very convention, uh, one of the panels kind of was about that because it was independent creators who were, who had written on both sides. They'd been indie, but they'd also written for the big two. Uh, and a successful book for the big two was like a few tens of thousands, and a successful book for an indie print is like maybe 2,000? You know, so it, it really depends on what you're trying to do, but that's, that's a fantastic point to make is how do you define success? What we wanted to do back then was not go broke. Just wanted to survive on your art. I had a day job yep. for the first six, seven issues of ElfQuest. I was working at IBM. I was bringing in a, a, a bi-weekly paycheck that was paying the bills and paying the rent and all of that stuff. So we didn't have the concern that I suspect a lot of independent creators may have. It was only after ElfQuest established itself maybe we can make a living at it, that I quit IBM and, and we have been, quote, independent in that sense ever since. Ever since. That's, that's very, very impressive. So uh, switching gears slightly, going to the content of ElfQuest, because our social climate is in a very different place than when you guys started. No kidding. <laughs> But, I mean, that is to say the, the, the diversity issue and, and all that, but also there have been some racier elements of ElfQuest. I mean, uh, Charlie made the point last night during the Dinkies that he used to get your books at porn shops. Well, he came by the table earlier today to clarify that. <laughs> it was a used magazine shop that, that also had yeah. porn. Had, had he was very, very particular about Fair that enough. and well, I told him no well you found it at a porn shop that's what we're saying from here on in, in anticipation of your question possibly but maybe not what I want to jump in and say is we are really really shocked that the issues that were the issues of the day back in the mid 70s racism homophobia mm -hmm. politics uh, hate uh, war, uh, gun issues, gun violence. We are shocked and stunned that here we are 40 years later and what are the main issues of the day? Homophobia, and, uh, gun mm -hmm. violence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a a and, little bit of a different angle, but yeah, no, it, it's yeah. legit. I'll give it to you. So, sure. so when we started ElfQuest, we wrote about things we cared about. We wanted to see if we could come up with solutions 
to some of these problems, and we found that the solution most often existed in the triumph of knowledge over ignorance. Not the triumph of good versus evil, but the triumph of knowledge over ignorance. And so we kept that theme going all the way to present day. And now that message seems to be more important than ever. And, and, and that, uh, that is a fantastic point to make, but the, the, where I was going to go with that is uh, the pushback that you receive uh, for not only just addressing those things, but having slightly more mature Adult. theme. Yeah, 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 yeah. So have, have, did you get much pushback when you started, and are you still, or do you now get different pushback? It's, you know, it's ironic. Everybody talks about the infamous orgy issue as the example of if you're going to get pushed back, that was the issue you're going to get pushed exactly, back on. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you the pushback we got. <laughs> With regard to the sexuality, which was understated and elegant, we got across the spectrum. We got a letter from an 11-year-old boy who said, thank you for not talking down to me. We also got a letter from, um, I guess, a middle-aged mother who tore those pages out of the issue, shredded them, and sent them back to us. Now, what we found so ironic about that was that also in this issue, there's violence. There are elves and trolls getting sliced and diced. And apparently she didn't have a problem with her kid reading that. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the perfect illustration of the insane hypocrisy of this culture that we live in, that war and violence, bloodshed, is fine, mm -hmm. but sex is still taboo, it's still naughty, it's still don't do that. That was what we got then. These days, I think uh, thanks to social media, we get a lot more positive nice. feedback oh, definitely. Uh, from readers who say, thank you, I found myself in ElfQuest. Your story of this character helped me overcome a similar problem that I was going through. We get a lot more of that. I can't recall really nasty pushback we've gotten recently. No, no. Uh, uh, after all these years of following the story, I mean, we've made huge demands on our fans. We've asked them to follow the story for 40 years, and many of them have. Can you imagine? And so... There's a lot of big two books that don't have that kind of following. Yeah. Well, and so they've been with us, heart and soul, and as we brought them to the conclusion of a big hero's journey, a big story arc, the inevitability, the way we set it up, and the inevitability of the story, they accepted it. Even if it meant some losses, they accepted it because we had built towards it as an inevitability. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. We, we had concerns <laughs> that those final issues, oh my God, they're going to hate us, they're going to hate the book, they're this, that, and the other thing. And 99.99% of the feedback was, this really tore me up, or I really had a strong reaction to this, but it was perfect. It perfect. was the way it was supposed to end. Nice. So that's actually a pretty elegant transition into how I wanted to end this interview, is because you do have 40 years of following, you do have these diehard fans who have read since book one, that, like I just said, that is not something that the big two have really at all. I mean, there's people who are familiar with the story, but they'll drop books for a while because the art, or the writer will change, or they just lose interest because it starts to drag. Constantly rebooting the story, and that's the big one. So, <laughs> what would be your advice? Because you guys are seasoned veterans at this point. What would be your advice to the big two so that they? Because sales are in the toilet these days for, for the, the mainline comic books. So what would be your advice to the big two to fix that if, if that's possible? Oh. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Quit messing with these wonderful characters. Quit taking them in directions they wouldn't naturally go. But see, that's the problem. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that, that's the problem. They don't know their own characters well enough to know a long-term direction. Because mainstream comics are done the way they are done, and this is a fact of life, yeah. Marvel, DC, they need to reboot Spider-Man, Superman, Batman every three years. Every three over. years, because yeah. the readership 
you know, once they get past a certain age, they lose interest in comics. They got to grab them back again. Lose interest in comics. You guys are living proof that that is not the case. Look, we set out to tell a story that was important to us. It right. didn't matter how many issues it took. It didn't matter how many years it might take. We had it mapped out from the start. And there were times when it was bloody hard to keep on going. But we knew we had to finish it or else we would not be able to sleep at night. Yeah. And we just did it our way. And those readers who were willing to take that ride with us, they took that ride, some of them for 40 years. Some of them are reading it to their kids. Some of those kids are reading it to grandkids. Right. It is generational. It speaks to people on a heart deep level. He's ElfQuest's biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a business model. I believe that a big corporate comic book publisher either knows about or is willing to uh, hew to. I, I, th there's no answer to your question, how do they fix it? <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sorry, guys, you know. No, no answer that would continue them making as much money as they want to make. But a word of hope. The characters are essentially sound. They are archetypes. You go back to the archetype of Superman. You go back to the archetype of Batman, Captain America, all of them. Yes. You find who they are there. Go back to the beginning. That is fantastic advice. And thank you, Peenies, once again for sitting down with Gently Nerdy and Big Show Entertainment Network. You guys are an influence to generations of artists, not just generations of readers. So it is awesome that you guys showed up at Dink. And nerds, this is going to be probably one of the one of the bigger interviews so i appreciate you guys sticking around and hopefully some of this advice will make it through not only to the new creators but the creators we all follow as well so thank you peenies as we said last night at the dinky awards where we were tremendously honored if we could do it you can do it just be true absolutely so again thank you guys for watching uh, this might be our last interview for the day. That was just so, that was so perfect. Uh, if, if somebody has not gotten into ElfQuest yet, how can they find you? Here, this is easy. You go to ElfQuest.com. That's our website. On the home page up in the upper right corner, there's a little button that says Read Online. You click that and you are taken to an index of the first 35 years something like 6,500 pages of ElfQuest from issue one, page one, on up to Final Quest, and you can read it online for free. That was our gift to new readers, that was our gift to old readers who have wanted to catch up. It's risk-free, it's fun, enjoy it, jump in the water. Awesome, and we'll see you nerds later.